Hello and welcome to the new season of Live Well with Barry. If you've been following this series, you know it's about living well, well-being, and inspirational, positive people. Now this week we have none other than the legend that is Andrew Roachford. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Nice to see you. And thank you for coming. I know you're a busy, busy man. Yep. <laughs> we had to, I'm telling you, we had to actually wrestle him to the ground to get him here today. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that. I've got this session, that session, cancelled, da, da, da. but we finally got him here, which is great. Kidnapped. Yes. <laughs> so happily, doing? happily. I'm doing really well. I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm enjoying being busy. Yeah. You know, uh, I think that I feel honored to be this part of my career. Busier than I've ever been, I think. You right. Because yeah, yeah. to many, it seems that you dropped out of sight yeah. for a while. Yeah. I guess it depends where you're looking from. Right. You know? I mean, uh, I have been doing a lot of work, a lot of gigging. You know, when I see people on the street and they go, uh, are you still making music? Yeah. It's kind of a weird question to me. But then yeah. I understand that if you're not on the TV and, and you're not mainstream in that way then people tend to think that you stopped um but i've i've never stopped uh i i'm a musician i'm a tour musician it's not stopping is not kind of an option an option it's yeah, not it's, an option so i've been i've been but i have been putting more time in europe possibly touring than i have in the uk but uh the uk gigs the numbers are going up now so i'm right going to, you're going to see a lot of me in the UK. So when you're touring, you're touring as Roachford, which is the band, right? Or as Andrew Roachford, a solo artist? Yeah, I think when I, when I started out, I was, uh, when I signed to Sony, I wanted a band around me. Right. I signed to Sony as a solo artist, but there were guys that I actually knew from college, friends from other bands that I was working with, and I felt like, well, we can make this work together. Right. And so Roachford was the umbrella name okay. of, of uh, the all band. Of your all of us, yeah, yeah. yeah all the projects. Um, and since, you know, we would stay together for about seven, eight years or something like that. Um, and then everyone did their own separate projects. Right. And the record label were saying to me, well, we think you should emphasize that you have a name, Andrew, and it's Roachford, Andrew Roachford. A lot of people didn't understand that, you know. Yeah. And Because uh, so, initially it came out as Roachford, and yes, you were the face of Roachford. So exactly. That's all everyone ever called you. Of course, you. of course, it makes sense. I, I kind of liken it to, uh, liken it to like Bon Jovi. Right. Because yeah. actually there's a John Bon Jovi yeah. in the band, but the band was called Bon Jovi. Yeah. It's, 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 it happens, like, you know, in, in, especially in my scenario where I was signed originally as the band, as, as a, as a solo artist, as a solo artist. Yes. Okay. And, uh, then I got the band in All right. and the record company weren't even sure about that because they just signed me, but being a working musician, uh, my managers at the time felt it would be good to, cause I've been working with the same guys, you know, um, cut them in in some way and, and let them have, some input and make it more of that kind of vibe rather than just right. session guys around. So then it became, Roche became, I guess, a band. Right. You know, yes. and um, which was great. You know, I mean, working with those guys, I learned a lot. Working with your friends. I mean, I'm working and with touring my friends. with your friends. Yeah, is, yeah. There's nothing better. There was never a dull moment. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely didn't feel like, you know, working with session guys, that, yeah. you know, they were all part of it, you know, and they were part of the sound, you know, and uh, so that was a great period. There was a there was a time me as an artist, everyone's growing, and they were growing as artists. That I felt like I needed to do something, you know, uh, as an individual. Yeah, and and to see other people, because the thing about a band is, is like it becomes like a marriage, and I didn't work with really with anyone else at that time. And I met some really interesting musicians and songwriters, but I was like, no, you know, this is a band vibe and, you know, and... Uh, it's all of us or none. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was very much like that. I mean, surprising some of the people that I I didn't feel I could work with because they... You felt they, like you were being unfaithful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
I didn't want to two time my guys. Uh, and then when we finally started doing our own projects, I mean, the bass player Derek Taylor ended up working with Gabrielle, and my guitarist Howie Gondry ended up working for Amy Winehouse. The drummer was the only guy that decided that he just wanted to get deeper into percussion and make percussion, and I think he'd had enough of the music industry, you know, which I understand. Yeah. But me, I felt like I was just starting. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was... Well, I guess it's different stages for different people yeah, because yeah. we all have different feelings, emotions. So mm -hmm. even though you've grown to a certain point yes. together, yeah. where you feel you're at at that point, you might be feeling in different places. Definitely. And when you think about it now, the first album came out 30 years ago. I'm too young. I don't remember anything that far. Well, it was nearly 30 years ago. <laughs> I was five years old when the first album came out. 30 so. years. <laughs> it is. It is. It's 30 years. And, um, and uh, things change. I mean, oh my God, if it was the same now than then, I can't see how I would have grown in any way, you know. Uh, well, as you were saying before, you know, it's a, a question of growth and reinvention. Yeah, and yeah, totally. Yeah making yourself constantly relevant and evolving yeah. and reinventing That's and right. evolving and reinventing. That's right. And kind of if you just work with the same people, there's no real scope for growth as yeah. such because you kind I, of influences come from all over, don't they? Of course. And I think the same goes for the rest of the guys in the band. I think they'd all got to that point where, you know, I mean, we, there was no, um, everyone thinks when the band is not working together that there's, some major sort of big yeah. fight, but it wasn't really like that. It just, it was just time to move on in my, in my, you know, and we had good times. And then I was like, well, okay, I'm Andrew Rochford. Yeah. That's kind of how I started. Yeah. When I signed, yeah, Andrew Rochford. And then the guy I was working with, the guy called Femi, uh, co-produced some of our stuff, said, why don't you just drop the Andrew? And I was just like, okay. I mean, to me, it was just my name. And, but people said it sounded really good. I mean, it's, um, my family, as you know, are from Barbados. Okay. And it's it's one of the places where you that name you can find lots of other people with that name. Yeah. Whereas in England and in Europe, it was you know, there's lots of Rochfords. Most yeah. people when I I are booking a hotel or they're like, Mr. Rochford, I'm like, no. there's actually an A, you know, <laughs> yeah, after Roach. the O. Yeah, I'm like a Roach like cockroach and <laughs> Ford as in car. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, in you know, in England it was people found it quite unusual just because of that A. And it then sticks in their mind, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it sticks in their mind. Mm. I think it did. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, where did it start for you? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up, I'm born and bred a Londoner. Right. Um, and for most of my childhood, I mean, at the age of, I think, eight, because I started off in Tottenham. Okay. And uh, mm. I went, yeah, yeah, okay. I went to primary, not primary <laughs> school, but like, you know, it was like a school for a while, right on White Hart Lane by the sort of uh, football ground. Okay. So uh, I think by default, I became a Tottenham uh, supporter, <laughs> uh, even though I wasn't even that big into football, but it's just because of location. And now I'm in south of the river. Oh, well, so that was up until the age of eight, you were in Eight ish, yeah, yeah. Then, right. Yeah, yeah. Then, then we moved to like around, first of all, like Borough High Street. Right. And then for a while, then we moved to um, Kennington. Okay. And I've, since then, I've kind of stayed pretty much like Southwest London, you know, between Clapham, uh, Streatham, Kennington. So this is where I grew up. Right. Uh, and when I was in Borough High Street, I was there for a few years, it was literally kind of the beginning of the city of London. Yeah. And I remember me and my brother used to cycle around and you know, you, you don't, you kind of take these things for granted that you are literally living in the city, which is kind of rare. When you meet your friends from America and they kind of go, you grew up around here. I'm like, this is what you used to <laughs> 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 This is my stomping ground, you know. My mum used to work in the post office and uh, the headquarters was in St. Paul's, by St. Paul's Cathedral next door to it. And so I uh, used to go there a lot as well. And so, yeah, properly, London based. London based. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're still in the South London yes. area, you said. Uh, yeah, I, 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 oh, I love it. And some of uh, musician friends, I know like, you know, Omar and people like that, and they they live around the same area. They've grown up, grown up for a while in the same area. And it seems to be 
at a point there was a scene like North London had a bit more of a uh, like an acid jazz scene when I was right. coming out and and South London was a little bit more soul scene you know definitely you know and so um I think I was supposed to be here. <laughs> yeah. Well, being a South Londoner myself, I know oh, what yeah, you yeah. mean about this soul scene yeah. and such. It's, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I remember. Like, when you used to go out to clubs, yes. you'd be hearing the difference yeah. in the areas, yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's a weird thing that separated by a river, but not that much distance, but it, it does seem to have a difference. Yeah. And, um, I went once to the Globe Theatre, which is like the Shakespeare Theatre in by the river, by the but South Bank. Right. Yeah, South Bank. And uh, I was taking a tour there, and they said that back in the day there was a South Bank, you know, on the other side, and on one side it was illegal to to play music live. To um, Shakespeare. Shakespeare couldn't do his plays on the North Bank, I think it was, but on the South Side was where it all happened. So you had yeah. the, the playwrights, you know, the actors, the prostitution the and musicians South because yeah, yeah. it was a lot freer. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's something to do with the energy, <laughs> but something's going on, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you moved down here when you were about eight. Yeah. And how was your school life? School life, my God, where do I start? School life. Um, At the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> the first school I went to was called Joseph Lancaster, which was off the old Kent Road, which right. was proper London, proper South London. <laughs> Indeed. You know, and um, I actually liked school you know at that point when I was younger uh, and but I was never really 100% present mm. in in mind I think my mind was always in music it was From always that, yeah, young age well I mean um, basically the story with music and me is that the Roachford family is generations deep in music I was not the first oh, right. my grandmother um, taught my uncles to play piano and her father so you know it was it's generations deep music i mean if you go to barbados with the elder people they'll go rochford musicians and teachers that was the two things all oh, right you know we were known for that so um but yeah so i basically had music my father was a drummer um they would be rehearsing in the living room my mum's brothers, bands, jazz and soul and the whole thing. And by the time I was four years old, I wanted a piece of the action. Already? So I started plonking on the piano at ridiculous hours in the morning. And it was so bad. And my mum said, we've got to get him some lessons. And that's where it all started. I started to learn the piano. At what age? Well, uh, literally around that four or five years old. Wow. And uh, I had tutors over the year. I was really, I was really um, fortunate considering that I do come from a working class background. Right. But my mum, you know, you, you prioritise what you prioritise, you know. Some of your mates might be going to school in some nice leather shoes and you've got plastic ones on, but you've got the private tutor. And, that, that's you know, right. <laughs> yeah, that, you, you're it's, really relaying my life. You know? Yeah, so it's like that Is for that, you. Yeah. yeah, you know, I started playing at the age of five as well. Wow. Up to wow. the age of 18. Gee, yeah. You know, to the point where it was, well, are you going to be a professional? And yes. it's like, well, no, you know, I've been doing piano lessons every Saturday morning now. Mm. It's enough. Yeah. I've been doing that for 13 years. I want to go out and do stuff with my friends like normal yes. good people, you know? Yeah, I understand. So, it's, 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 a, it's a lifestyle choice, isn't it? You know? So you, you were in music from then. Mm. And what were your first jobs? Well, it's funny that, uh, I, like I say, I, I've been blessed that I've never had another job. Wow. I now, actually, the only other person I've heard yeah. say that mm. is Junior Giscom. Wow. Who said from day one, yeah. um, which you'll see in the other interviews we've done already, yeah. that it was always music for him. He never had any other job. No, no. I, I mean, I must have spent a couple of months on the dole. But the only reason why I was on the dole was because I was, when I was, I ended up working my uncle's band, but I couldn't sort of declare it because I was working in clubs and in some funny strip joints and so <laughs> okay. And I was still like, I was like up from like 14 years old through to like in my teens, you know, uh, later teens. So I couldn't really, it was cash in hand jobs. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So as far as I knew, I wasn't working. I was a layabout, but I never was a layabout. I was always, I've been working with my uncle's band playing piano with all the older 
Caribbean guys that were seasoned musicians. And it was scary, but my uncle always said, if you play with people who are better than you, you'll get better. You know, they have to, you'll have to get, go up. Well, that's absolute wisdom yeah. right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> if you hang with people that are better than you, yeah. it encourages you exactly. and inspires you to do better. Exactly. And so I think that was a great, uh, a great grounding for me musically. Because I was still at school, well, you know, I left school at 16. Right. Um, my, Where was your last school? My secondary school was in Peckham. It was called Thomas Carlton. That's and, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that was the one I said, uh, um, I remember uh, Christopher Eubank. I, I was, yeah. <laughs> well, pushing, because we used to have, at dinner time, you'd have a queue for dinner right. to go in. And he, he was always a kid that tried to push into the in front. <laughs> and I'd always look at him and I'd go, why do people allow him to get away with that? And they go, because he's got bigger brother, and the brother was quite feared in the school. And I was like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> oh, so he went to Thomas Colton? Yeah, he went to Thomas oh, Colton. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he was in Thomas Colton for a while. Is he your year or older? Well, there's a year difference between us, okay. I think. Uh, and uh, so I knew all of his mates from back then, and, and, and also, you know, the next thing I knew, Years later, him becoming a professional yeah, boxer professional. was kind of like just as well. Christopher you back. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he was in my dinner yeah, queue. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that was. But no, but the, the good thing about my school was it was predominantly it was a lot of black kids at my school, you right. know, and but the teachers generally seemed that they had a mission to uh, like a bee in their bonnet to make us do well. Wow. Which is unusual. I was just yes. going to say that. That is commendable yeah, yeah, for yeah. you to actually recognize it. Because yes. a lot of people that relay messages from schools like that, yeah. are like, you know, they were either victimized or racially abused or yeah. discouraged from yeah. their dreams. No, we had you a lot actually of, we say had a, the opposite. No, we had a bunch of hippies teaching us. I mean, I mean, not every teacher. There was a couple, but you, they stood out like a sore thumb. The ones that were really jobs worth and maybe a little bit iffy in their, you know, uh, <laughs> racial Did views, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, but generally, I mean, I got, I got, I mean, my music teacher, who was also my English teacher and was, was one of the biggest champions in my life in a sense that he, he said, you know, you've got it. And he encouraged me in music, got me to start a school band. Wow. And, you know, I remember the school band when we first started out because our school wasn't, as well facilitated as some of the schools in Peckham were. Right. Peckham boys, I mean, ours was a bit of an embarrassment. Um, it was kind of a school that they sent people to when you got kicked out of other schools. <laughs> oh, really? But it had a lot of reputation it had. Yeah, because oh. it's one of those where you, when you were enrolling, it was the last one that was available and I, I was late, I guess, my mum was later. And so I didn't know anything about it until I got there and I was like, okay. But I have to say it was a great school and um, and I, I, a good example of facilities is that we didn't have a drum kit and I started a school band. We had two cymbals and I had one on that way around on the table and one upside down, use it like a hi-hat. And it was so embarrassing. And my teacher said to me, you know what? It's to do with the headmistress at the time. She wasn't really... Into um, music. Yeah. But, but what we did is we played at her local church as a surprise thing but with the equipment that we had. And she was so embarrassed. Literally within a few weeks, we had a real drum kit. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Shame yeah. people into Shame it. Shame people. But it was such a great uh, school. I'm, I'm glad I went there. Well, mm. you're one of the products of it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm still in touch with, well, I have been in touch with some of the teachers still. You know, they've become friends. And well, that must be quite rewarding for yeah. them to see. Yeah you know, their efforts that they put into yeah. you and you've actually made it something yeah, yeah. Except, special. Except my math teacher, because she was just like one, one that kept telling my mum, get him to stop playing music, you know, get him to stop playing music and concentrate on the real subjects he's supposed to be doing. And my, and my mum so. said no. And then years later, she said to my mum, I'm glad you didn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, hey. Uh, well, so did you show promise as an academic yeah. as well? Uh, well, I, my reports were always, you know, he's got, he has got promise. Could do better. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't want to ap apply. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, there were subjects that I, uh, 
that I think I was good at that seemed natural to me. I loved English, uh, found it fascinating. I loved the sciences, yeah. physics, and you know, chemistry and all that. So if it, it was interesting in that way. But then for some reason, maths, and that was a teacher that was telling my mom to stop music. <laughs> maths for me, nah, just But at least she was big enough to come back years later and say, she was thank big God, enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you didn't yeah. listen to me. <laughs> yeah, I was very impressed of that, that she said that. And it was it was meant it was heartfelt and no the teacher that encouraged you in music are you still in touch with him? Yes, I'm, I emailed uh, Mr. Griffin was my music teacher, right. and uh, I I spoke to him recently, and you know I probably haven't given him enough props because when I you know when, when you that know, was the opportunity <laughs> well no Mr. Griffin was the dude and if you if you ask anyone who from my age went to that school he he was really um, he was. A champion for him because he also taught English and it was very mix and match with the teachers um, and in, in encouraged us to learn about the history not just British history but the Caribbean history so we had we had that to thank him for as well you know right. because he recognized that a lot of the kids from that school were Caribbean you know and uh, we're learning very little about themselves apart yeah. from sugar and slavery. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> when I was a kid, most people didn't even know where Barbados was. They were yeah. like, what's that? <laughs> yeah. Little dot on the map, sometimes you didn't yeah, see indeed. it. Indeed, most of the islands are. <laughs> yeah. But that teacher, you know, I, I, I spoke to him and, you know, they're very proud of me. And uh, it's, 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 it's great that we've managed to remain connected in that way, you know. Yeah. Um, it was great times, man. Oh, a bit of reminiscing there. Eh? See it? Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. It's good. I left school at 16, that was it, though. Yeah. You know, I knew what I was going to be doing, and it was going to be music. Okay. Yeah, no so doubt. So, can you recall your first major gig? First major gig? How do I define major? I mean, as in my band, I guess it would have been when we were opening, we did it, we started off supporting. Right. And the first thing was we were touring with a band called The Christians, who okay. were who were huge at the time. Were you signed already? Uh, oh, okay. I was just getting signed, yeah, I was signed. Okay. And um, after we toured with The Christians, which was great, and that was, that was amazing, getting on the big stage and, you know, just the idea of that many people coming to see a band, you know, because before that I was, playing in colleges and, and clubs and stuff, which was great. But this was a whole new thing, you know, yeah. the big stage as they call it. And then after that, we straight went to gig with a label mate, which is a guy called Terence Trent Darby, who was, who was the man, you know, he was, and that was one of, to this day, was one of the best uh, double bill, because he basically said, you're, you're too good to be a support. I've got you billed as, a, so it was like a double bill thing. And that was, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was scary, but you know what? I learned a lot because he was an amazing, he was American. And Americans, at the time, they had much more of a professional approach to what they do. When they're looking at it, it's like a job. So I'd watch him in the sound check, and even when he was speaking to the audience, it was all rehearsed, really? which is a very American way. English people will get up there and we kind of wing it. Organic. Organic and wing it. Yeah, but yeah. America is about the showbiz and you got to get it right and you yeah. know yeah to be fair to him it worked yeah. you know because it was just it seamless and he was a f and is a phenomenal singer and we became friends you know right. um, and it was great having someone in my corner because he was one of the guys that when my demo was going to CBS Sony he was one saying you got to sign this guy you know, he got to sign this guy. And they listened to him because he was the big... Oh, somebody in big, um, yeah, 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 you know. And uh, then, then then, I put my first album out and things changed. <laughs> How was the feeling? It was, it was well, great. I guess the feeling starts from being signed, doesn't it? Because that's what we yeah. were aiming for in those days. Yes. The industry's kind of changed now, hasn't it? It's not, Just a little. <laughs> not quite the same, I guess. You know, but the whole thing then was about getting that signing and... Yeah, but you know what, I think, you know, because I had a very, up to then, between being leaving school at 16 yeah. and I got signed, I was already like 19, 20. 
So in that time, I got a lot of experience. I'd worked um, in a studio uh, uh, on, with a band called The Clash, which was a punk rock band on yeah, their last album. Nice and uh, basically, Joe Strummer took me under his wing and he, he, he talked to me a lot about the industry and I wasn't so naive and gullible. And I knew that I needed to get a record deal simply because in order to make the record the way I wanted to make it, the studios cost a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. They're like sponsors to me. So when I got a record deal, it wasn't like, oh, a lot of people, they go, oh, well, I've made it, I'm there. I was not it's like that. work to do. Yeah, I was just like, now I can get in the studio and I can get the equipment that I need. And it was more about that. I hadn't even looked that far ahead yeah. as to, well, then what happens? Yeah. You know, so it was almost a little bit of a shock. Right. All the stuff. And I never forget that the week we had the first record out. Stop me if I'm talking too much, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so when you ask someone about their life, it's like, okay. That's, that's why you're here. <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> and it, and we, we did a club gig at Marquee, which was a very famous yes, um, see, no, on Water no, Street. Oh, oh Marquee, I oh, don't know. Getting you're thinking game. about the other one, which was called the, uh, oh my God, I know the one you're talking about. Yes, it was, that was a famous one that's close. Yeah, the Mean now. Fiddler. Mean Fiddler. Yeah, but the marquee was like Jimi Hendrix, the Beatles, the Stones, everyone had sort of started doing gigs there. So it had that history and I walked in, did the soundtrack, I came out and there was this queue going all the way down Wardour cool Street. <laughs> I said it to someone in the, in the uh, in the queue, I said, who are you going to see? And he looked at me and was like, you, you pillow, <laughs> never forget. And then you go on stage and they're singing the words that you spent time in your bedroom, yeah. in your own space, writing, and all of a sudden, those words are being said back, back to, you, to you, and you go, this is, this is different, because you, ex- you don't know to expect that. Yeah. You know, this is another world. It was like, I realized that I kind of, stepped into another mode yeah, there. Yeah, and it's actually, your words have more power now. Yeah, exactly. You know. you know, the thing that I love, I'm sharing it, mm. and other people are actually loving it too, which yes. is the ultimate feeling. The, there's nothing better how, over the years, people will come to you, and I'm sure a lot of artists will tell you this, where people will tell you how much your songs or your best song meant to them, and how it saved them from depression, or when their kid was going through something or blah, blah, blah. And I don't think there's, I can't imagine, but I mean, I've not won any major kind of awards as far as, you know, industry things. Um, but I can't imagine there being a better feeling than that. Yeah. I really can't. <laughs> well, every song that every songwriter writes has meaning to them. Mm. There's no such thing as a bad song or a rubbish song. <laughs> you know, to, to the public, they yeah. listen and say, oh, I don't like that or I don't like this. But to the writer, every single one has a meaning. I think so. I think as an artist, you, you want to invest in what you're doing and put yourself into the music. It's, it's more than just, you know, writing a song. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. You actually just, you, you're just actually relaying stuff in your, that's coming from your heart, especially like with soul music and stuff. And I was going to say to you, like, um, when I left school, I was I ended up in a reggae band, which is really yeah. random. Yeah. Uh, and how it happened was my mum bought me a bass guitar, which I don't even know why up to this very day, because I never played bass. And I, the first day I had it, I was standing in the bus stop with this bass, and this guy comes up to me and says, yeah, you play a bass like that? And I kind of went, yeah, because <laughs> I was bluffing, you know. And he, I ended up getting uh, asked to do an audition for this reggae band, and I don't know how, uh, but I managed to get the audition and I ended up playing bass for this band. And eventually I started writing a few songs. And in those days it was the lovers rock scene yeah, right. and the dub thing. And, uh, but even when I was writing that kind of thing, I was put everything <laughs> into what, you know, as in, it was never light for me. It was always like, yeah. this is really what I'm feeling right now. It's like, you know. At this moment, this yes. is what I'm yeah, feeling. Yeah. Yeah, and having said that, I learned uh, soul, the feeling of soul, I, I think I got introduced to by a lot of the Jamaican reggae singers, right. people like Ken Booth, yeah. Dennis Brown, and all these great singers that 
made me realize the Gregory Isaacs and Gregory the and then you find out that they listen to all the American singers you know and then you get to the root because that's what I'm about is finding the root of what it is that I'm doing you know? and that's what I actually love because I do a radio show on on radio station and a lot of the tunes that people know mm -hmm. I like to go and play what we say in the oldest version excursion yeah so they don't actually know that they were two versions before that. Yes. One yes. of which was the original. Yeah. They just listen to the one now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, so as you say, it's quite interesting to yeah. find the roots. Yes, exactly. Of the, the music and the Oh genre. yeah, it's, it, if you if you want to learn as a an artist and have a overview and an understanding, I can never understand from like a lot of today's generation, they don't want to look back more than a generation if that so if they're into R&B, for example, they won't go further back than R. Kelly. That's even going two way back. Whereas me, you know, I used to listen to music from the, the 50s, the 40s. Yeah, yeah. I wanted, and then eventually, like, okay, the African music that that uh, this is where it started, just to find out how it came about being how it evolved. It, yes, into being what it is. Now. That's it. Yeah. And I think when you're an artist, you're supposed to be. It's about being open. It's different if you're you're not, because when I went to school, most of my black friends were like into like reggae music and some were into soul. And you had a either you were into reggae or you were into soul. You couldn't be into, into both. Yeah. You know. Couldn't be into both and you no. couldn't be into anything else either. Anything else. <laughs> you know. So I was a freak of nature because, you know, I remember going up to one of my mates, what do you listen to? I'm, I'm listening to some Latin music. And they look at me like, what? <laughs> I'll never forget he said to me, you like that white man music, don't you? And I was thinking, Latin. Latin? Well, it shows yes, their limitations, exactly. not yours. So, exactly. You know. And even at that time, they, my, my mates weren't listening to Bob Marley. They were listening to Dennis Brown, but they wouldn't listen to Bob Marley because it was obviously too commercial. Too commercial. Yeah. Too produced and everything. And I just thought, really, is that the way to be? And I'm, and I'm happy to say today that I've met a lot of my heroes from back then. I'm, I was lucky enough to meet Dennis Brown and have a conversation with him. He knew who I was, which was weird. And Because uh, if you'd have told me that when I was at school, I'd have been like, no way. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Dennis Brown, it was just like, they don't have those, um, those narrow prejudices about music. If it moves them, it moves them. Yeah. And that is something that was more like, uh, later on we got this thing about holding on to like only listening to this, because this is our culture and anything out of it, isn't you know, yeah. and it didn't. It became more of a political thing, you know. And it's, you know, it's certain generations like our generations before they, they are aware of things outside of their box. Yes. So you know, we would know the relevance of Duke Ellington or yes. Billie Holiday yep. or Ella Fitzgerald or Charlie Horn. Parker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. you knew who those people were, yeah. and they're not even close to our generation. Exactly. Yet you find that the generations following us, they're unaware. Yeah. And as you said, they don't want to go further back than R. Kelly. They don't want to go further back. And the ones that dare do that, normally are the ones that are way ahead of everyone else. Yeah. Because they, their music has a lot more of a, a rounded depth to it. Because right. they know exactly what it is that they're doing and where it comes from. So they're doing it from the ground up. Yeah. The ones that only want to go back a generation, it's hard to, to get that much depth to what you're doing. I'm not saying you can't, um, but it's just, it but you've seems... you've got less to work with. Yeah, yeah. You've you have less to, less, work with. less to work with. Exactly. You're working with a narrower band. And, and I would always say to, like my nephew is getting into, he's getting into music now. He's making beats. He's producing. Luckily, he's, he's a bit different because he grew up in America. Um, but, and so he listens to all kinds of music. And he grew up in a musical family, you know, the yeah. Roachfords. But his friends think he's crazy as well because they only want to listen to the grime music. If it's not electronic, they're not interested in those beats. And he wants to put real instrumentation and they just think, what is going on? But I, mean, I think that's the difference between people who listen to music yes. and people who love music. Yes. There's a big difference. Yes, a big you know, difference. you listen to music, you can mm. hear something in the background, you throw yourself around to it. But people who love music, you love that world music because yes. great music comes from Africa, from India, from of South course. America, from the Caribbean. Yeah. 
from Europe, you know, it's from people. A, so you can listen to Stevie Wonder mm -hmm. as well as listen to Frank Sinatra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know and actually, I mean? when you listen to Stevie Wonder, you'd be surprised how much influences you're listening yeah. to that you would never believe. believe you know? yeah. And that's the point, you know, and um, the whole thing about, uh, but I think as well with the, what we call the layman, the people on the, who are actually buying the, a lot of these people, especially when you're younger, your music is an extension of, where you think you fit in in society. Okay. So it's also about That's an your, your, yeah, what it is, it's like your fashion, the group that you belong to, it's almost tribal. So the reason why you wouldn't listen outside of that is because you're defining yourself by this music. Yeah. And it's not really just about music, it's about your, where you sit in society. And I love that idea because exactly what you say, it, it defines how we absolutely weren't. <laughs> yes. We fit into anything. Because yes. I can remember going to the soul clubs dressed yeah. in my small collar shirt and my skin tight jeans and yeah. my jazz slippers. Yeah. Come home at one o'clock, put on a silk suit, mm -hmm. gabichi, yeah. crocs, and go yeah. to a blues, to exactly. a track of blues. So exactly. you know, two opposite ends of the yes. spectrum, but still an appreciation and love mm -hmm. of music. Mm -hmm. And in time, you look back and you realize how how you know, fickle that is in a sense because if you speak to most people of our age and who grew up in that era, now you say to them, do you listen to soul and reggae and they come look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> and back then I was fusing music and I think that's how I came about doing the music that I do today. Yeah. Is that I was always trying to, I mean, listen, reggae music is there, uh, soul music and there's people out there that do it so well. I'm trying to find my own thing always, you know. Right. And um, whatever comes out, um, that's, that's me, that's what well, I want. It's what you create and it's what mm -hmm. you feel. Exactly. So you, what was your first single? My first single uh, was a song called Family Man. And uh, it was on my first album, Family Man. And it was kind of a bluesy, rocky type thing. Right. It was the blues because of the vocal and like, it came from the blues. But obviously when you crank up the guitar, <laughs> yeah. you make that leap, you know, which is really uh, shocking to me. Like, okay, the guitar's just a little bit louder and you, with that you've just changed your whole audience, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Bit of distortion. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And later on I, I came to find out that it was a bigger issue in America. When I went to America, then I realized I was getting into politics by just cranking Playing, the cranking guitar up. up. The guitar. They, they, it was a big issue. I was, I was told by the record company that in no uncertain terms that if you don't take that guitar out of your music, we because we love you as an artist, but we don't want this guitar in the music. You know, even though they'd signed Living Color and loads of other black bands that were doing from the black, the Black Rock Coalition thing. You know. Um, Fishbone, 24-7 Spies. I mean, I used to hang out with these guys. And uh, and even Terence Shendarby, to an extent, was part of that movement, Lenny Kravitz, later on. Right. But there was a whole thing where it was challenging society and, and stereotypes, and they didn't want that. Right. If, you're, if you're a black artist, you have to make music for the club. It has to be for the club. Yeah. It has to be putting their limitations yeah, on you, to dance, your creativity, to, yeah, and not for the live stage. And and you know there was not a, a lot of bands around who were black bands. That I, especially from England, it was just like who, and you do these gigs like festivals, and you just be the only black band in the festival because the, the black art, the black artists were mainly for club. Yeah. It was always a club, club. And there was a kind of a rock feel to what you do. Yes. I mean, Family Man, the first single, was definitely very rocky. Yeah. And um, the, What was the next single, the big one? Cuddly Toy. Right. Which came about, which is weird how that came about, because when I did the first single and we had the album finished, Cuddly Toy wasn't even written. And that was a song that became, in the UK at least, my biggest song to, to date. Right. And I just basically... Because it really puts me in mind of the Womack and Womack. Oh, yeah, I love I, Womack. Yeah. yeah. So what was your biggest single, the one that everyone knew? Yeah, it was Cuddly Toy. It was the one that people in, this, in the UK knew. Right. I, I had bigger singles outside of the UK, but in the UK. And that was written last minute. My album was already literally in the shops. And, and then I'd written this song, which was kind of... I just needed an up-tempo track 
to put in the set for the live gig. And I was listening, I started listening to James Brown at that point. And I thought, yeah, something that we can jam on. And then we went in the studio uh, with a producer, Mike Brower, and then recorded it in a couple of days. They took, uh, and we mixed it in New York, and they took the uh, album out of the shops and repackaged it with that song. Well, so they had to repress yes. the whole thing. Yeah, so there's people who have copies of the first album without the song, which became the biggest song. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think they got refunded, but whatever. But yeah, that was the second single. Okay. And, and when it, it's very much in keeping, as I said, like mm, being Womack and Womack. Which feel. Yeah, I, I love Womack. Is I it really, Womack and Womack? Well, there's Womack and Womack, which is uh, Cecil Womack and his wife, Linda, who was yeah. the daughter of Sam Cooke. Yes. And then his brother, or his cousin, Bobby Womack, is a completely yeah. another yeah, separate yeah. artist. But Womack and Womack did Love Wars. That's it. You know, it's very teardrops. Love Wars. Yeah, I know. You know, the thing about that was I realized that that was my niche. Because it took me a while up to this point in my life to really find what was it I was trying to do. Right. And really, the Womacks had already done it. And they had, they'd got this southern soul thing. Yeah. Which is really what I was trying to do, okay. which is soul music, but the Southern Soul was still using live instruments and they still had the blues element in their music, which yeah. a lot of the rest of the black music had kind of gone away, away from, from that it. because yes. it was like, we don't want any more of that. It reminds us of a time we're trying to get away from. The new uh, black society was progressing and it become more, you know, refined in that way. So the Luther Vandross thing of the 80s was more where heads were at. Yeah. But yet, if you would go to the south of America, in the countryside of you the, you know, that sound, they still kept yeah. that thing to this day. Really? Yeah. Okay. You can, you, you can still go to the bars and they still have this, you know, the Zydeco thing, the, the, the old, that kind of soul, southern soul, it still yeah. exists to this day. And to me, it's still, it's still, you know, it's goosebumps for me when I hear that music. Really? And it's still what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I love doing it. it. You're well, doing I'm, it. I'm, I feel like I'm finally, I've, uh, I've come the long way around, but I'm finally uh, realizing in a place, music in a place where musically where I want to be that really yeah. says, this is what I've been trying to get at through my various what experimentation. What was the feeling when you made that first big signal that just went massive as a uh, cuddly toy? Cuddly toy went uh, eventually. I mean, it was back in the day when you could spend time going up in the charts. But when it took off, it took off big time. And you know, all of a sudden I was doing my band, we were doing Top of the Pops and all these big TV things. I saw oh, that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and you couldn't turn on the radio for more than 10 minutes and not hear it. Mm. And to an extent, same in America, I went over to America and it was in the top 20 in the billboard. And all of a sudden things were crazy because then I was considered, I guess, a pop star. Yeah. which I kind of went, oh, I'm a pop star now. And it was kind of weird, because then you'd be doing gigs and there's screaming girls and the whole thing. And it was great, you know. It was good for the ego as a young, a young yeah, guy. It's yeah, like, yeah. hey, I'm a pop star. But in my heart, I knew it wasn't who I wanted to be. Yeah. You know, my, my heroes were the people who, like Stevie, who were, who were allowed to be musicians as well. Elton John's, these kind of people, Sly and the Family Stone, that's kind of where I naturally want to be, but I was with a major label and it was about pop hits, so I fell into that and I enjoyed it for a while, but eventually I, I found my way back into, I guess, cultivating a more album artist, which is what I've always been, but I had to convince the British public that I was that because Cuddly Toy was so big, yeah. People's perception of me was that was a pop star, yeah. and they and they kind of thought that's what I was, and I was that guy that got up and on stage and was being that. But they never considered me a real musician, which was just like, how did that happen? I needed to address that, okay. and I needed to address that. And so that's kind of what I spent now, the last years of my uh, career so far, doing is actually completely constantly surprising people. Now they come to a gig, and because of the resurgence of the 80s, they've, all the cuddly toy crowd have been coming to my gigs, and they kind of go, they don't know what to expect. And then they come to the gig, and they get something that they never bargained for. Yeah. And I can't explain to you that feeling, because I, I always know what I am. Yeah. But 
if I had a penny for every time someone said, I didn't expect that, you know, Donald Trump, nothing, you know, I would have <laughs> ridiculous money. Well, because, one of my favorites was, should I? Is it, should I? Uh, how could I? How could I? That's yes, it. Yeah, I mean, those are the songs that really were, were more getting to what I was about, was dealing in subjects that I felt actually speak to people, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, Cuddly Toy did a lot of good things for me in my life, yeah. and it brought me a crowd, and it brought me a stage and everything. But um, at the same time, it was almost like a red herring to what people thought I was. Whereas a How Could I, that that album feel and Permanent Shade of Blue, which were later on in my career, which did better in Europe really than they did here because people didn't know Cuddly Toys. They didn't have this preconceived idea. Yeah. So they, they know me as a live performer and I've always been that, you know. Okay. Mm. Now, you are a friend of one of our previous guests, Ben Love. How did you all encounter each other? Well, with Ben Love, Ben Love's an incredible guy. Amazing. You know, uh, he happened to be, at the time, uh, the, one of the girls that working at Sony and A&R yeah. were his girlfriend. And I think I was dating a friend of his girlfriend. <laughs> okay. And it's kind of how we met initially and became friends right. through our, our girlfriends, right. you know. And so he, he used to go up to Sony offices all the time to see his girlfriend. And I was always there because it was my label. And uh, back in the days where you could just hang out at record companies, uh, there there. <laughs> and get free CDs, and you go out with a bag full of goodies, you know. Those and, were the days. <laughs> and there was so much money in the record business. Children, I feel sorry for you guys now because there's just, it's just a lot different. And it's a lot, it's, it's different. Some ways it's good, but now the days, there's not that much money in, in, yeah. in music. And so it is harder. A lot of the young musicians I know have day jobs or they are working in um, function bands where they play weddings. And they're quite happy to because yeah. they don't know anything else. Whereas back when I was younger in the band, that would have been like, oh no, no, oh, no, I'm not, no, but yeah. I'm not the wedding singer, no, 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 no. And by mitzvahs, it was like, nah. But it's, you do what you gotta do to, to survive as a career in music, but it's, I wouldn't like to be starting now on that oh, level. Yes, because you see, there isn't as much money in it as they used to oh, be. No and it is, it's really, yeah. as they say, you know, enjoy every moment as it comes because it's never going to last forever. Nothing lasts yeah. forever, so enjoy it while it's yeah. there. Having yeah. said that, I think there was too much money in the music business at a point in the 80s because it became about something else that it wasn't. Right. And there was a lot of squandering of stuff and money and, and there was just yeah. a lot of waste, you know. People, oh, I got to fly over to New York to have a meeting on a Tuesday, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go by Concord and I'm gonna stay at the most expensive hotel and eat at the most, and it's on your expense account. And they come and it was just a lot of that rubbish going on yeah. that you put you when you look at it, it was like millions were being spent that didn't need to be spent. Yeah. People just squandering. Yeah, it was really right it was really actually quite shameful. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah. I, I say that it was just like. You look back and you go, oh my God. Even, you know, with us, we were staying in studios. We were recording in studios that were like 2,000 pounds for like a few hours in the day for two for a day easily without not including extras for hiring gear, for food. And then you realize that within a few months, you know, you've racked up a fair bill. Yeah. And sometimes you just, because you're not directly paying for it, the record company paying for it, you're kind of watching TV, you know, it might be the World Cup is on. Meanwhile, the clock's ticking, the clock's ticking. Now you wouldn't dream of doing that. <laughs> you know, switch off yeah, the TV. Record. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. obviously you're an extremely busy man, as I said. And yes. So wrestle you to the ground to get you here. Yeah. What does Andrew Rochford do to look after himself in amongst all the madness, hysteria, and craziness that is the musician's life? Yeah, that's a good question. I think with me, I'm a little bit of a contradiction because, you know, I do like, like when I'm on the road, I do like uh, to have a good time. I like to have a drink here and there. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, so like I've been touring with Mike and the Mechanics as well. And you've got like 14, 15 guys on the road. You get to the hotel, you're still wide awake because you're wired from the gigs. So a lot of drinking is going down. But at the same time, I've always been into being agile. That's my thing. Yeah. I come, you know, I love dancing. I love, we used to play a lot of sports back in the day. Like we played 
basketball, father side football, badminton, did a bit of squash, and I've kept up some of those things. Right, okay. You know, I still like racket sports. And still being active and I, I, I mean, if you come, you've got to come to my shows. You know, when I finish... Well, I will now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I finish my show, I'm just, I'm soaked because it's, it's about energy. Yeah. And people who have kind of been listening to me from the beginning, who are now a lot older, yeah. they're looking at me like, how, how, are, you, you, how are you still doing that? Well, listen, I'm telling <laughs> you, even when I played music, the 12-inch singles that I could start dancing... 30 years ago yeah. or 40 years ago, mm -hmm. from the beginning, the whole yeah. eight minutes. Now, I can't start before eight minutes on. I can do the last two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> or start off slow <laughs> and do the whole thing. But, you know. <laughs> Are you listening, ladies? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but, I, but I'd say, not for me, I, there's something about music as well that energizes the right music. If I go to a club and they're playing music that I don't like, I'm tired within the, an hour. But if you put on the right music... You can go all night. All night, yeah, yeah, yeah. All night. <laughs> and, and before I go on stage, I have at least an hour of James Brown. Okay. Get and that's fired like, up. That's, that's my drug. That's my before okay. uh, gig drug. And you can ask anybody. I generally don't do a gig without that hour of... It's like a sermon of James Brown. And that's really? like... That puts the adrenaline in my body... Because it's... I don't know so where right, it's coming that's from. that's the stuff to get you pepped up. Yes. What do you do for the relaxation? This is a good question. I think, uh, and there's also music that can bring me down, right. you know. Um, I love a good bit of chilled Stevie as well and Donny Hathaway, that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. But yes, I do meditate a bit. Okay. And through, of recent, I've learned about being conscious of your breathing. Because it's something that you just do automatically. And you, but when you're aware of it, you can really become more in tune with your whole body and your heartbeat and what you know. And, and I'm generally quite um, a chilled guy. I think your temperament has a lot to do with it. Right. You know, if you let, if you're the kind of person that takes on stress too much, that's the worst. That's the biggest killer because your body is just tense. Never at rest. It's, it's never at rest. rest. Your heart rate is, you know, whereas me, I'm quite, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm quite a chilled person and, I have quite a positive outlook, and I think that that's more, of course you have to look after what you eat is important. I'm not, uh, I'm not a crazy junk, well, you, when you're on tour and you haven't got a choice, but I like to balance between, okay, if I'm gonna eat a bit of junk because I'm in the middle of nowhere and all the restaurants are closed, like, you know, but I make sure I eat well when I can. Yeah. And that's just balance. It's it's just about eating quality stuff and and I like that's one thing that I don't like to skimp when it comes yeah. to money. Well as you they know. say food is either poison or is medicine. It's very true. So you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Well thank you very much for your time. It's You're been an welcome, absolute man. pleasure. Yeah. And letting the people see the real man behind <laughs> Andrew Rochford. Chapter <laughs> one. <laughs> Chapter one. I'm sure there'll be more. Oh yeah. Thank you very much for watching, guys. And if there is anything in the show that resonates with you, please do let us know on the website, our Facebook, or Instagram. Let us know you're watching. Let us know what you think. Till next time, take care. See you soon. Yeah. Bless you, man. Thank you yeah. very much. It was, it was great. See you,